Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Mapledale. And if you're in the church gathered or if you're away from us scattered, we uh, welcome you. To... Let's try to begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you and praise you that on this almost last day of January, we can have a bright, sunshiny day outside. We can feel good about the fact that we're all still alive after two years of dealing with pandemic. And uh, we can thank you for a lot of things. But what I want to thank you for today, Father, is that you will use your word through the power of your spirit to change hearts and lives for your kingdom. And so, Father, we pray that you might do exactly that and help this preacher to be faithful to the text. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're in the Gospel of John, and we are at the point where the Lord Jesus Christ is going through the six trials that he will ultimately face before being sent to the cross. And uh, we're going to deal to... to to this morning with the first of those trials. Uh, But in order to set the stage and understand the whole process, uh, I'm going to just ask that you bear with me a little bit, because before we jump into the text, I want to give some background information about the the political background of of the area at this time and all that stuff. And I also want to point out a few different things. For instance, it's not uncommon amongst humanity uh, that we have things that we fear. And everybody has some sort of fear. Uh, I know in our house, if there's a spider, uh, the fact that our house is still standing after Kathy sees that spider is a miracle from God because she would use a nuclear device if that was available to her. You know, everybody has some sort of fear. uh, And those fears are all over the map. We have fears of medical procedures. A lot of people are are terrified about going to the dentist. There's just something about that screaming, whiny little sound that sends shivers up our back. Uh, A lot of people are afraid of public speaking. Uh, I think maybe the biggest fear amongst humanity is the fear of being found out. Now, that means something different to everybody, doesn't it? But, I mean, being found out, I mean, uh, spiders, bugs, snakes, heights, darkness, being alone, clowns, farm animals, needles flying. I mean, uh, there's so many fears. Some people are afraid of going out. Some people are afraid of staying in. And there's not always a rational cause for our fears. But we have them. And they're real. And when we are exposed to our fears, they become sometimes overwhelming. And in fact, one of the things that I really enjoy, part of the work that I do as a maintenance technician, is I get to use high lift. Uh, equipment, things that will lift me up to the roof of a gymnasium or up to the top of a tree or something. And some of these high lift equipment will go 60 or 70 feet in the air on a, on a stalk. So you're up there just in a basket bouncing around. I, I thoroughly enjoy that. I love going up in those things. It's like, oh, look how far you can see and they bounce. It's like a circus ride. Uh, and I've got a lot of people that would think that they would enjoy riding with me and they always want to go up in them in those buckets. And uh, I've taken a couple different people up there, and it's really interesting. You, you watch them, and they're kind of holding on to the, the edge of that bucket, and it, it's going up about 5 feet and 10 feet. Now, this is really cool. And then you see the knuckles start to grip, and you see them turning white, and you see that person just getting that stare, the, that thousand-mile stare. And I'm thinking, we're only up 15 feet. We, we got 50, 60 more feet to go before this thing maxes out, you know, and we're not even bouncing yet. And, and the truth is that they just freeze. because and, and they didn't know that they were going to be afraid of that when they got in the bucket. It was only when they were exposed to it that the true fear, and I fly a lot, and inevitably I'll sit next to somebody sooner or later, and I'll tell you when it's time for that plane to take off or it's time for that plane to land, uh, they just go into some kind of personal cocoon. I mean, they're, they're somewhere else. They're in their, in their private space. Now, I happen to love watching out the window and, and seeing how that works. I mean, kind of reminds me of my old hot rod cars. It's a boom, and you're going, you know. But um, Jesus has been preparing to face his fears and going to the cross and going to these six trials. 
And he prepared himself for the fear that he held, and it was a real fear. I mean, he had a good cause to be afraid, uh, but he prayed, and he instructed his disciples, and he pointed out his betrayer, Judas, and now it's the time to walk into those fears. Can you walk in to your fears when it's time? And what if one of your fears, one of, what if one of your greatest fears is opening your mouth to talk to somebody and share with them the truth of Jesus and, and you can't bring yourself to do it because it's so frightening to you? Aren't we glad that he walked into his fears? Now, I want to explain why he was afraid. What it was that he was going to face. See, at this point in history in Jerusalem and Israel, there was just political chaos. Uh, we've got political chaos going on in our world today and in our nation today. And, you know, we read the headlines and we hear all the stuff. We understand what's going on. Uh, but the conflict between the Romans and the Jewish people at that time was even far greater than what our conflicts are in the United States at, at this moment in history. Uh, Rome had actually garrisoned a number of Roman soldiers in the fortress Antonia, which was, uh, scholars believe, in the northwest corner of the Temple Mount. Uh, they actually built a, a barracks big enough that they could overlook the city and, uh, and keep all their soldiers there. Uh, and they had uh, basically about a legion of soldiers in the Jerusalem area. Now, uh, let me explain. Romans use different ways of, of measuring their troops. And the basic gang of Roman soldiers was a cohort, which would have been about 480 soldiers with some supporting people. A legion would have been about 55 soldiers. That's 10 cohorts, all the cavalry, reserves, and, and, and officers, and whatever. Uh, so in the whole Roman army, all across the Roman Empire, uh, there were 30 legions, 17,000, 18,000 troops roughly. Uh, now, in Jerusalem, just one portion of that, obviously. Now, the, re the leaders of the Roman military were men that were proven in battle, and the ranks were not always designated by how many men they commanded, uh, but by for how many years that they had served, that elevated them to that spot of command. So they had a little different way of doing it. Uh, in our own military, sometimes we can get very young you know, officers because they go through officers training school and uh, they may get a command without the wisdom behind them to, to operate that command. Uh, but a centurion uh, who would only uh, manage 80 men uh, would have roughly 15 years of service in the Roman military. Uh, and as you worked your way up, the centurions would report to the tribunes, they would report to the legionnaire, and the legionnaire to the prefect, and the prefect uh, all the way up to the, to the emperor of Rome. So uh, there was a hierarchy of how they reported. And, and every time you moved up a level, you had more years of service, more experience, and uh, literally everybody in the whole Roman government was, was from the military. Uh, it was a very militaristic government, so... We've had that at times in the United States. So we think of President Eisenhower, who was a very famous military individual. Uh, in addition to Rome being in, in Israel and Jerusalem and everywhere, uh, there was also the government of Israel itself, which consisted of a king and consisted of the royal priesthood uh, led by the high priest. Now, the high priest was supposed to, biblically, be appointed for life. He was the high priest until he passed, and then the appointment would move on to another. Uh, but that wasn't exactly the way it was. Because Rome was exerting its rule over Israel, uh, Rome appointed a king over Israel, and the king would then appoint high priests as he saw fit. Sometimes they didn't even make it a year or two, and he would just put another high priest in place. And the name of the king family, the ruling family of kings in Israel, was Herod. But there was more than one Herod. We read in our Bibles, Herod this, Herod that, but there's more than one Herod. Herod the Great was the Herod that was alive uh, up to and, and right during the time of the birth of Jesus. And he was the one that persecuted all the babies uh, and killed all the little ones. 
uh, and and he was the one that also in 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 Israel did a lot of building projects and things. He had built up the temple and made it beautiful and restored it and and put it to right. He built a great palace. In fact, he built several palaces, and it's been my great pleasure to tour some of those. Uh, there was another Herod, the son of Herod the Great, named Herod Antipas. And he's the Herod that would have been in control when Jesus was facing his trials, uh, roughly AD 33. Somewhere thereabouts, 30, AD 30 to AD 33. And so he was the Herod that also had John the Baptist martyred. And then he was the, uh, uh, the, the next Herod that would come would be Herod Agrippa who is the grandson of Herod the Great, and he's the one who persecuted the church that was going to come after Jesus' resurrection. Uh, he's the one that put James, the brother of John, uh, uh, to death. And, and Herod Agrippa II was the one that the Apostle Paul would meet with as he went about his missionary journey. So there was a succession of Herods, but they ruled because Rome told them to rule. They didn't rule because they had any authority on their own. Uh, they were puppets of Rome, essentially. Uh, now, the high priests, as I mentioned, were also appointed by the Herods, the various Herods. Uh, and now, the, the Levitical law said that a high priest must be of the family, of the clan, of the tribe of the Levites. Uh, but Rome didn't care about that, and Herod didn't care about that. Uh, but in most cases, that's the way it worked out anyway. But the high priest then was in charge of the J Jerusalem Sanhedrin, which was the ruling body uh, of, of Jerusalem, of Israel. And uh, there's a difference between the high priest and the chief priests and the regular priests. There's three different classes of priests. And, and we have to understand as we read through our Bibles, we see chief priest, we see priest, we see high priest. Regular priests just did the day-to-day -day work in the synagogues and, and in the temple, doing all the things that were there. The chief priests were the ones that basically administered the temple, administered the synagogue, the Sanhedrin, and all that stuff. And then, of course, there was a high priest, a singular one high priest, uh, that was the ruler of all the priests, and who was also the one who alone, with a rope tied on his leg in case God found him sinful and killed him, uh, which maybe is why they had so many high priests back in that day, uh, but he would go into the Holy of Holies and pass through that forbidden curtain uh, on the Day of Atonement and make atonement for the sins of the people of Israel. Uh, the priests, the chief priests, the high priest also led the feasts and festivals of Israel, uh, and they were the ones that ultimately oversaw the day-to-day -day operation uh, of the city and of the Holy Land. Now, because of this Roman rule, and because these Herods were king and placed over the people, and because of all the strife and everything, Rome said, put this priest in, take this priest out. Herod said, put this priest in, take this priest out. And, and the priesthood was a mess. It was not as God intended in the Mosaic law. It was not operating in accordance with, with any Jewish holy law or anything uh, like that. It was, it was basically completely lawless. And essentially all these people were doing what they wanted to do based on their own whims, their own personalities, their own drives, and their own needs. Now we see things like that happening in our political system, both sides of the aisle. I'm, I'm not playing favorites here. I mean, I don't care where you look. There are people that are using their political power to make themselves wealthy and famous and, and whatever. It's, it seems a shame that we could send a senator to the Senate to represent the people, and they come out of the Senate after a career there uh, as, as multimillionaires or even billionaires at times from all the, the kickbacks and things that they, that they take. But the high priest during the trial of Jesus was Caiaphas. And Annas, who was in the story as well, was the former high priest. Five of his sons were high priests, and Caiaphas was his son-in-law. And so Annas is still in charge, as we're going to see as we jump into the text. Uh, but a number of his sons and son-in-laws were also made high priests. Uh, it's interesting that during this time of a revolving door for the high priest, that there were two high priests who carried the same name as Jesus. 
There were two high priests named Jesus, Yeshua, in, in, in the Hebrew. And so that's just an interesting little tidbit of history. So in Israel, and especially in Jerusalem, we've got literally a political nightmare going on. The Romans were extracting taxes from the people, and if the people didn't have any taxes to, to give, uh, the, the thought of the Romans is just squeeze them a little bit harder and they'll find something somewhere. Uh, so that was what was going on. Rome was sick and tired of policing the rebellious Jews. The rebellious Jews were sick and tired of having Rome rule over them, and the whole city was a tinderbox of political strife, uh, that made our Antifa and, and move on protests and riots. You know, the things we've seen in America over the last couple of years look pretty tame. And in fact, they were very used to going out and stopping riots. These Roman soldiers were good at what they did. And in order to make sure there were no riots, they would just send overwhelming force. And they had these short swords that they would use with reckless abandon to get rid of the, the troublemakers. So this is the scene that is set now as we jump into the text and take a look at what happens with Jesus and, and his trials and everything that follows. So we're in John chapter 18, beginning in verse 12. John 18, 12. And this is in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, and Jesus has prayed and sweat blood, and Judas has betrayed him. Peter has cut off the ear of the high priest's servant, and now we're at this point where Jesus is being bound, John 18, 12. So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. And first they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. And it was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. Now I looked this up because I just wanted to see what was underlying the text in the original Greek. Uh, and this band of soldiers, this band of Roman soldiers, uh, was in fact a cohort, which is again about 480 Roman soldiers. They came to arrest one man in the garden. Remember Jesus said, I am he, and they all fell down? 480 soldiers to arrest one man. They weren't out to play. That's the way Rome took care of problems in, in, in Israel. They just brought overwhelming force. The high priests were not out to play. They had had enough of just Jesus' character, and they were going to take care of this business, and they had their hearts and minds set on it, and tonight was the night. Now it's interesting that they don't take Jesus to the high priest. Who do they take him to? They take him to Annas, the father-in-law, the former high priest. And why would they do that? Well, because this was the middle of the night, and it was actually unlawful uh, for the Sanhedrin to conduct their business in the middle of the night without the proper witnesses and such in place. It was completely against all their, uh, their rules and laws. Uh, they needed to have public trials with public witnesses in the light of day. Now, Annas had been appointed high priest by Quirinius. You've heard that name before. Anybody remember where? In the Gospel of Luke, in the Christmas story, he was the one that ordered the census, where all the people were counted that caused Mary and Joseph to go to Bethlehem and birth Jesus there. He was the governor then. He was replaced by Pilate a little bit later on, but he's actually the guy that appointed Annas as the high priest. Now, the high priest, as I said, was supposed to be in office for life, but whenever Rome or whenever one of the Herods decided to make a change for their own use, uh, they would just make that change. And that's why we've got Caiaphas still kind of ruling the roost, or, or Annas, I mean. Uh, he was the former high priest and probably the father of the clan and, and the most important one in their structure. But Annas is the actual high priest. So much for the Mosaic Law as the purported basis for this trial of Jesus. They're already violating it in any number of ways. Now, the prophecy in this verse about Caiaphas is found a little bit earlier in the Gospel of John. If you turn back a couple of pages to John chapter 11, 49, we see the prophecy there. And here we read, But one of them, Caiaphas, 
who was the high priest that year. See, this was his turn, uh, just a few chapters back in John. He said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. He did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. And from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. So Caiaphas, the high priest right now, son-in-law of Annas, uh, was involved from the very beginning in this plot, in this scheme, to put Jesus to death. And he's been working on this and planning this and, and praying for this and hoping for this. Everything that was with him, in him, wanted this to come about. Why? Because they, he thought that if we kill one man, we might stop the rebellion that's bringing Rome down on our heads. Did it? No, not at all. Roughly 40 years later, Rome leveled Jerusalem, just literally took it apart stone by stone. But the hour is now here where the words of Caiaphas come to pass. But John first inserts the story of Peter. It's like a play, you know, if you, you, you're watching a play or a movie on TV or something, and, and, and you're watching this scene and you're kind of getting into it, and all of a sudden the scene shifts. It's like, where are we right now? Oh, oh it's, this is the other guy's story. And so that's what's happening right here is the other guy's story. John 18, 15. Brave Peter, remember the one who said he would never deny his Lord? Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. And since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest, but Peter stood outside the door. And so the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. And the servant girl at the door said to Peter, You also are not one of these man's disciples, are you? And he, that's, that's Peter, said, I am not. And now the servants and the officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing and warming themselves, and Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. Now this passage describes only two disciples who went along as Jesus was bound and taken to the, to the area, the courtyard of the high priest. And it's interesting that John knew the high priest well enough to gain entrance into his home, into his courtyard. Now, by the way, John always is, is the one who doesn't self-identify himself. Uh, when he writes about himself in his own gospel, he's always the other disciple or the disciple that Jesus loved or something like that. But he tells us about Peter, and then he tells us about himself. And he brings Peter from outside the courtyard into the courtyard, which probably would have been shielded and covered and protected from the wind and everything. Uh, and there is a charcoal fire happening in this courtyard, a fire of coals, according to the Greek word. Uh, and, and the people that are there in this time are just using it to get warmed up. Now, I find it really interesting. We could just see that word and just kind of run right past it. They were having a charcoal fire. But in the whole of the New Testament, the word charcoal is only used two times. Here, and on the day following the resurrection, when Jesus appears to all his disciples on the shores of the Sea of Galilee and uses charcoal to cook breakfast from them, and what does he do on the shores of the Sea of Galilee? He restores Peter to full discipleship after his great sin that we're about to see. Now I find it really curious that those are the only two places charcoal is mentioned in the New Testament. And, and I just dwelled on that for a second as I was preparing this sermon. And I don't think that this is a random chance. I think the easiest thing that Jesus could have done as he cooked that fish by the, by the, the shore of the sea was gather up sticks and twigs and make a fire of wood. 
To make a fire of charcoal took some effort. The same here, why would they not want a fire of wood and sticks in this courtyard? Well, because you didn't want to burn down, you know, whatever was hanging in that courtyard. So you'd use charcoal, which produced heat, but no flame, right? But I don't think it's an accident that Jesus was cooking fish on charcoal when Peter came ashore off that boat. Because I think the charcoal fire was going to remind Peter of something in his life. And it just hit me that the Lord was saying something to Peter here without using words. And it made me wonder if that some of us don't have a fire of charcoal episode in our own lives. And even as I reflected on that, uh, I recalled that my fire of charcoal was spinning a dial of a radio in a truck one day and, and hearing Dr. J James Dobson, a Christian psychologist, speaking about the pain of losing a child because it was the losing of our second child that was my first fire of charcoal. That's the moment when I cursed God and died. And that's the thing that Jesus used, that, that exact same episode that, to bring me back into a right relationship with God as he did with Peter, bringing him back into a right relationship with God. What's your charcoal fire? And how might God use that to change your life in a radical direction? Now, in the story, we also have this servant girl tending the people of the courtyard. And she recognized that Peter was a disciple of Jesus. We're not told why, we're not told how, but Jesus and Peter and John and all the disciples were all over Jerusalem teaching and healing people. They had had many run-ins with the high priest, chief priest, you know, all the, all the different leaders of Israel. Uh, I mean, they were everywhere. And so she obviously at some point in time has run in to these disciples and she knows who they are. And what does she say? She makes a simple statement. Aren't you one of this man's disciples? And what does Peter say? I am not. Peter. Why the lie? Especially knowing that Jesus had just said probably hour, two hours ago, that Peter was going to deny him three times. Now, folks, I've been in ministry for a lot of years already, and there's one thing that I see on a really consistent basis, far too consistent. It's that people tend to lie about things, and the thing that they tend to lie about the most is their own selves, their own spiritual condition, who they are. They lie about their prayer life, they lie about their salvation, and they think that no one can see through their lies. But I've got news for the liars. God sees through your lie. Jesus sees everything, and you know what? So do the rest of us. It becomes really easy to see who is just using religious words and who's actually walking a life in the Spirit of Christ, doing what Christ commanded him to do. It's, it's just painfully obvious. And why don't we take apart people like that? Why don't we just bring them out and, and crucify them publicly? Because Jesus himself commanded us to not pull the weeds out with the wheat. And, and he told a parable about that. He said the wheat and the tares, the wheat and the weeds, look so much alike that if you try to pull the weeds out, you're going to pull some of the good stuff out too. So don't do it. Let me handle it because my angel, when they come, when the time for harvest comes, will know the difference and will separate them. And so people ask, why is it that you let people in your church that don't even live like church people? Why is it that you let sinners in your church? Well, first of all, I'm a sinner preaching to sinners, so of course we let sinners in church. I'm not kicking myself out today. Are you kicking yourself out today? Praise God, we're here, right? But still, why do we do that? Because we want people in the church to hear the Word of God and to be changed, to be made right. John flips back to the story of Jesus. John 18, 19. 
the high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. And Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in the synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. And when he had heard those things, the high priest that is, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? And Jesus answered him, If what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? And Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now, again, there's a couple of things happening in this section of Scripture that violate all the Jewish laws. We just saw in the video we watched that it was a law that they would were not able to strike. They weren't supposed to strike someone. They were supposed to treat people with respect. They also had to bring two or three witnesses to confirm every truth or every falsehood that they heard when they were in an official trial. But that isn't what's going on here, is it? This is an interrogation like someone might face if they drive their car into the wrong neighborhood and get surrounded by gang members or bullies or, or criminals. You know the scene. You've probably seen it in a in hundred movies by now. You know, people make the wrong turn and they end up in the wrong neighborhood and all of a sudden the tough guy is, is smashing out their window and he's asking them questions. And what do they always ask? They ask questions they already know the answer to. So why ask then? Well, they ask simply because the idea is, is that the bully or the gangster or whoever wants to get something from you that they can use to, to salve over their own conscience. He deserved it because he talked back to me. And isn't that exactly what's going on here in this situation with the high priest? The attack is coming anyway. The assault is coming anyway. But the ruthless bully, the gang leader, just wants you to say something or do something where he can say, see, now I got you. And for the high priest of Israel to be doing this to the Son of God is an affront second to none. It's on a line, it's on a par with the devil accusing Jesus. But it always plays out with what, you disrespect in me? And then the beatings commence, right? Now Annas knew what Jesus taught. He knew every single thing that Jesus taught because Jesus went all around the country and wherever he went, the high priest, the chief priests, were always there investigating. When Jesus went across the river and fed the 5,000, they were there to see what was going on. When, when he traveled here and there, they were there to see what was going on. They were always there. He didn't do this because he didn't know. He did this to provoke a response. And now Jesus did respond, and his response is what? It's forthright, it's accurate, it's true. And again, what Jesus is doing here is he's literally condemning this high priest because Jesus is standing on the principle of Mosaic law. If you do this, you need to bring witnesses. You know the law. There have to be two or three witnesses to confirm your words, to confirm my words. And again, Jesus does this to him, and that just infuriates the high priest because he hates getting trapped into this box where he has to be found right and pure and true. It's so much easier to govern people when you could just take them out in back of the building and shoot them. And isn't that where we're headed? The servant strikes Jesus with, with the blow of an open hand. And I want to mention that this is the Jesus who was already bruised I mean, his whole skin and, and his whole body is already bruised beyond imagination from sweating the drops of blood as he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane in agony. 
What's left unsaid in the text is what it is that Jesus should have said to this high priest in order to not be found insolent. I mean, what should he have said? Oh, you're so great. Man, I love you, Annas. You're the bomb. Let's make you high priest forever. Well, he couldn't say that. Why not? Because that would be a lie. And see, if Jesus lied to the high priest, then who would be guilty? Isn't that what Annas is gunning for here, to extract a lie from Jesus? To get him to say something untrue? Because then he has grounds. But Jesus is the perfect one. He's the Holy One. He cannot be other than who He is, and He cannot speak an untruth because what He speaks is, and He is the King of glory who is prepared now to die for the sins of the world. Now right at that moment, when we're in the thick of Jesus duking it out with with the false high priest, John flips back to the other scene with Peter, John 18.25. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself, and so they said to him, this is all the people standing around the barrel of the the coals, I would imagine. They said to him, you also are not one of his disciples, are you? And he denied it and said, I am not. And one of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, see this guy knows who Peter is, right? He asked, did I not see you in the garden with him? And Peter again denied it, and at once a rooster crowed. Now Matthew shares some details here that John didn't. Matthew 26, 72. Matthew says, and again he, that's Peter, denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. And after a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly you too are one of them, for your accent betrays you. And then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. And to really paint the picture, turn over a couple of pages to Luke 22. Luke 22, 61. And this part hurts, okay? And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he, that is Peter, went out and wept bitterly. Now the Greek word there does not mean glanced. It means that Jesus turned and looked intently on Peter. You know how we do that? You know, I see you. He looked at Peter as Peter denied him. Can you imagine what that look looked like? Can you imagine the Lord of glory looking at you with that look like... Especially when Peter was the one that was bragging about how he would never deny Jesus. He'd follow him to death. He'd go anywhere for him. Ultimately, he did. But not now. You know, when we think about Jesus looking at us, what do we think about We think about, well done, good and faithful servant, and we think about that Jesus that's happy to see us and greet us to heaven. We think about the Jesus that's just beautiful and Lord and God and and, and our God of providence. We, We just think all good when we see Jesus. And for good measure, I mean, that's the Jesus we worship. That's the Jesus we love. That's the Jesus that saves us. But that same Jesus can also turn and look at us with a look that says, you're not of me. And if he looks at us that way, it's final. There was more than one betrayer at work on this horrid night. 
Now here's the truth. As much as we love Jesus and want to follow Him and, and be with Him and all that stuff, every single one of us have deserved that look at some point in time in our life, probably this week. It's, it, it, it's just really simple. We know who we should be. We know what we should do. We know how we're to build His church and how we're to worship our God and how we're to love each other with the love of Jesus, how we're to love our own spouse as if our spouse is the church, the bride of Christ. And yet we fail in every single one of those avenues probably almost every week at one time or another. It's just who we are. And yet do we repent when we have that problem? Do we turn? Thinking of Peter, do you think he felt condemned when that look came upon him from Jesus? Well, Luke tells us he went outside and wept bitterly. I can't imagine he did. He felt condemned. He knew what he did. And he would not look at the Savior in his eyes again until after the resurrection. Think about that. He had to carry that with him now for multiple days. I don't want to get too far ahead of the story. But on Resurrection Sunday, when Peter comes screaming back from the tomb, saying he's alive, he doesn't see that same look in the eyes of Jesus, does he? He sees a forgiven look in the eyes of Jesus. He, he sees a Savior in Jesus. You see, and, and that's the story for us. That's where we have to live. Now, Peter needs to repent, and, and, and repent doesn't just mean going out and, and weeping bitterly, although that is often a part of it. Repent means first that we're sorry, and second that we do something about being sorry. We turn and go in a different direction. And in a biblical sense, repent always means turning from sin, turning from hell, turning from the devil, and turning to Christ, our Savior. There's only one direction we can turn. I mean, to turn the other way, to go the wrong way, is just idiocy, it's lunacy. You know, even if we have some semblance of smarts within us, it seems like we should all know that turning to Jesus is the better option. The only real option. I mean, who, who wants to go to hell? And yet we live in a world where we idolize rock bands that sing boogie with the devil and all that kind of stuff. We watch movies where people are going to hell for every minute of the movie. And, and we somehow feel satisfied with watching and hearing that stuff. Why? Because I'm not as bad as that guy. But maybe we are. Maybe we are. Now... John skips over the whole part of the trial that happens in the house of Caiaphas, and he goes right to Pilate. So next Sunday, we're going to pick up the story looking at when Jesus goes to the house of Caiaphas, the parts two and part three of, of his trial. And then in between there is parts one, two, three of the Roman, uh, where he's behind between Pilate and, and uh, Herod. And he's got quite an ordeal waiting, waiting for him yet in the next 24 hours before he's finally nailed to that cross. Quite an ordeal. What's happening right now is Jesus is being moved to the dungeon right off that courtyard of Caiaphas' uh, palace, dropped through that hole and left until morning when they'll bring him before the actual high priest and have a real trial with fake witnesses. Six trials three by Jewish leaders, three by Roman leaders. He would be found guilty to death by all the Jewish leaders and innocent to life by all the Roman leaders, but ultimately convicted to death by Pontius Pilate, the Roman leader, for political expediency because it was simpler to just kill this man and make the Jews happy than to quell a resurrection, or a revolution, excuse me. He's not going to quell a resurrection, is he? <laughs> Amen. But for this morning, that's enough. For us to consider. We've got all these actions of Peter, we've got all the actions of the Lord, we've got all, the, all these actions by the soldiers and the high priests. And the truth is, we're going to face a lot of trials in our life. 
Some of them are true trials, some of them are false trials, but every single one of them has the power to make us feel like we are carrying with us more than we can bear. There's only one we can turn to to help us when, the, when those days come upon us, and his name is Jesus. Amen? His name is Jesus. How we react as we face those trials and look to our Savior will make all the difference in the world. Will you join me as we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for telling us this story in such a way that it can touch our hearts and souls. And Father, we pray even now in the name of Jesus that when we look in the eyes of Jesus, what we will see is an accepting and forgiving Savior who completed what it is that you sent him to complete in order that we might be souls saved for an eternity in heaven. Father, I pray that the promise made in the scriptures for us that we are now under no condemnation because of Jesus Christ the Lord would be true in the heart and soul and life of, of every individual within hearing of this message. And Father, help those who hear this message in this church and out to understand that there's only one cure for their condition. There's only one help that will help them. And that help is to turn from their worldly efforts, turn to the Savior, and, and to turn to Him and profess that He is the Christ of God. He is the Lord. He is the Savior. He is the Messiah. He is the one who can change me from what I was into what I am now. He's the one that did that for me and did that for countless others, and He can do it for you. Father, I just pray that you would do that mighty deed in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen.